Judaism, Christianity and Islam are typically grouped together under the same umbrella of Abrahamic religion. This video is going to show that far from being a religion in the monotheistic lineage of Abraham, Christianity in fact has its origin in pagan cults. Christianity has the doctrine of the Trinity, in which God is said to manifest as three persons, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's compare this concept of three related divinities to different pagan religions. The ancient Egyptians had the trinity of Amun, Re and Ta. An Egyptian hymn reads, All gods are three, Amun, Re and Ta. Babylonians worship the trinity of Nana, Shamash and Ishtar. Hinduism has the concept of Trimurti, in which the supreme god, Brahman, is said to manifest as the three forms, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. The Hindu text, Padma Purana states, He who is that eternal god became the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. The Greeks had the goddess Hecate, whom they described as triple-headed and goddess of the triple ways. The Romans venerated Diana as Diva Triformis, which means three-formed goddess. A Roman poet wrote, O three-formed goddess, to thee I dedicate the pine tree. Northwestern European tribes worshipped a group of three female deities known as Matrone, which means matrons. Persians had the triad Ahura Mazda, Mithra and Anahita. An ancient royal inscription reads, May Ahura Mazda, Anahita and Mithra protect me and my building against evil. We can see that this concept of three related divinities is an ancient phenomenon which has been present in different pagan religions throughout the world. It's important to point out that the Christian trinity differs in its finer details when compared to these other cults. However, this basic concept of three related divinities is common to all of them and is fundamentally pagan. The Greek philosopher Aristotle had this to say about the mystical significance of the number three. Just as the Pythagoreans say, the whole and all things are delimited by the three, for end, middle and beginning have the number of the whole, which is that of the triad. Wherefore, we use this number also in the worship of the gods, taking it from nature as a law of it. In Christianity, Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, who is said to possess two natures, one divine and one human. This idea of a God-man hybrid is fundamentally pagan. Greco-Roman religions were filled with tales of gods procreating with human women and begetting God-men. For example, the chief god in the Greek pantheon, Zeus, visited the human woman Danae in the form of golden rain and fathered Perseus, a God-man. Hercules, also the son of Zeus, is another example of a God-man. The New Testament states that the role of the incarnate Son of God is to be the saviour of mankind. The Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. The belief that gods became incarnate as men and acted as universal saviours was also common in paganism. Perhaps the best known example is the Roman dictator Julius Caesar. An ancient inscription has this to say about him. Descendant of Ares and Aphrodite, the god who has become manifest and universal saviour of human life. Here, Julius Caesar is said to be a manifestation of the gods and the saviour of mankind. Another direct parallel can be found in the Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This statement that Jesus the Son of God is the beginning of the good news is also mirrored by another Roman dictator, Augustus. The birthday of the God has been for the whole world the beginning of good news concerning him. The concept of a human being who is a divine son of God, the saviour of mankind and good news was a sort of template that was applied to people of great power and authority. We've seen that the history of paganism is littered with such examples and the Christian conception of Jesus 
was just another incarnate god in a long line of incarnate gods that had preceded him. The early Christian apologist, Justin Martyr, considered a saint in the Catholic Church, admitted that Christianity had borrowed its concept of divine sonship from pagans. When we say that the Word, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he was crucified and died and rose again, and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing new or different from what you pagans believe regarding those whom you consider sons of Jupiter. The Gospel of Matthew states that Jesus foretold he would die and rise again after a period of three days and three nights. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Very early on, churches taught that during his three day and three night absence, Jesus descended into hell. The Apostles' Creed is an early statement of Christian belief. It states, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. These beliefs mirror an ancient Sumerian myth about the goddess Inanna, which states, From the great heaven, Inanna set her mind on the great below. Inanna abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended to the underworld. After three days and three nights had passed, thus let Inanna arise. The Gospel of Matthew also tells us that something extraordinary happened when Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, none of the other Gospels mention this astonishing incident of the walking dead. Only Matthew reports it. Let's compare the accounts of Matthew and Mark regarding the death of Jesus. Notice that even though Mark's account is virtually identical to that of Matthew, Mark does not mention the rising of the dead saints. If such a miraculous event really happened, then there will be no rational reason for Mark to omit it from his Gospel. Consider that the Apostle Paul had the perfect opportunity to mention this story when he was preaching to an audience that was sceptical about life after death. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul could have easily proven that there is life after death by mentioning the numerous resurrections that took place when the dead saints walked the streets of Jerusalem. He did not mention anything about such an event because it never happened. Flavius Josephus was a first century historian who was born in Jerusalem. Even though he was a prolific writer and documented much about the city, he also failed to mention anything about this most public of miracles. Even conservative Christian scholarship rejects the historicity of this event. The New Testament scholar Mike Lacona stated that this story is a strange report and literary special effects. The theologian William Lane Craig stated that, probably, only a few conservative scholars would treat the story as historical. If Matthew's story of the walking dead is an invention, then from where did he get his inspiration for such a tale? It just happens to be present among pagan cultures. The ancient Greeks celebrated a three-day festival known as Anthesteria, during which it was believed that the dead came back to life and walked among the living in the cities. The Roman poet Virgil wrote that when Julius Caesar was assassinated, phantoms of unearthly pallor were seen in the falling darkness. The Gospel of John narrates to us the following conversation between Jesus and his disciples. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Here Jesus instituted the ritualistic consumption of bread and wine, said to represent his flesh and blood, 
Note the great importance that is placed on the ritual. It was claimed to bestow eternal life. All of this has precedent in the ancient Egyptian cult of Osiris. Osiris was believed to be the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The body of Osiris was represented by bread. The valley gives you bread from the burial of her father Osiris. Your loaves are Osiris. The blood of Osiris was represented by wine. My blood is drunk, even my redness. You are wine, you are not wine, but the guts of Osiris. The ritualistic consumption of Osiris in the form of bread and wine was believed to allow one to partake in the nature of Osiris and be granted life. Your eyes are opened by the earth, your limbs are gathered, raise yourself up when the great bread and this wine-like water were given to him. The bread and wine ritual is performed in churches to the present day as a way of commemorating Jesus' resurrection back to life. In Christianity, the symbol of the resurrection is the cross. Most Christians assume that its design is based on the T-shaped Roman torture instrument. However, the Bible itself does not precisely describe the shape of the cross. It merely states it was made of wood or timber. You may be wondering where its design originated from. Like the bread and wine eating ritual, the cross also happens to have a parallel in ancient Egyptian religion. Compare the Christian cross to the Egyptian Ankh. Their resemblance is not just in shape, but also in meaning, as Egyptian hieroglyphics use the symbol to represent the word for life. Here, the Egyptian god Horus is bringing a dead pharaoh back to life using the Ankh. We can see that the Ankh and Christian cross are both linked to resurrection. The early Christian historian Socrates Scholasticus recorded a fascinating argument between Christians and Egyptian pagans who both laid claim to the cross. When the temple of Serapis was torn down and laid bare, there were found in it, engraven on stones, certain characters which they call hieroglyphics, having the forms of crosses. Both the Christians and pagans, on seeing them, appropriated and applied them to their respective religions. For the Christians claimed this character as peculiarly theirs, but the pagans alleged that it might appertain to Christ and Serapis in common. Just how did the original message of Jesus transform from the pure monotheism of the Old Testament into the paganistic religion of Christianity today? Did early Christians get together and agree upon a secret agenda to corrupt the religion and the masses just went along with it? There is no need to resort to conspiracy theories to understand what actually happened. When there are multiple ideologies in a geographic area, you often find that there is an exchange of ideas with the dominant ideology prevailing in the exchange. This is known as syncretism. The people who allow changes to creep into a religion are not necessarily doing it with an evil intention. It may come about due to pressure from society or ruling authorities. It may even seem natural to adopt certain beliefs and practices if culturally that is what a people are used to. Historically, this is what happened with Christianity. Jewish people were the initial target audience of the evangelism of Jesus and his disciples. However, they largely rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus only gained a sizable following after he ascended to heaven, when the Apostle Paul started evangelizing to Gentiles, i.e. non-Jews. Paul preached a modified version of the message of Jesus that was stripped of its Jewish elements, such as circumcision and keeping the Sabbath. This watered-down version appealed to Gentiles who started to embrace Paul's teachings in large numbers, culminating in the pagan Roman Empire adopting Christianity as its official state religion several centuries after Jesus. So, we need to understand the mindset of the Gentiles who first received Paul's message in order to understand how paganism crept into Christianity. When Jewish people heard stories about Jesus performing amazing miracles, they would have understood him in the same context as the likes of Moses and the other Israelite prophets who were all granted signs and wonders by God. However, such stories about Jesus would have been interpreted very differently by pagan Gentiles. This is illustrated in the New Testament book of Acts, which informs us, In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that the man jumped up and began to walk. 
When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. We can see that the pagan Gentile peoples to whom Paul was preaching were in the habit of idolising human beings. With this in mind, it's easy to appreciate why Gentiles from a pagan background would idolise Jesus. Upon hearing stories about the miracles of Jesus, they would naturally interpret him in the same light as the Greco-Roman gods they were used to. The early church emerged in both a Jewish and Gentile world, and so Christians had to reconcile the pure monotheism they had inherited from Judaism with the polytheism they had derived from paganism. Gregory of Nyssa is a 4th century bishop who is venerated as a saint in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. He wrote, For the truth passes in the mean between these two conceptions, destroying each heresy, and yet accepting what is useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma is destroyed by the acceptance of the word and by belief in the spirit, while the polytheistic error of the Greek school is made to vanish by the unity of the nature abrogating this imagination of plurality. Here, Gregory of Nyssa acknowledged that the Christian conception of God is neither purely the polytheism of the Greeks nor purely the monotheism of the Jews, but rather a mixture of both. This is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold blind predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood, the crops would not grow, and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn catalogued celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized, or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's sun the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's Son and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun, anthropomorphized and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about this solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun, or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness or night, and, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set while in the evening. Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light or good versus evil is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by a figure known as Arnop and thus began his ministry. 
Porus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus, resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Tammuz, of Sumeria, born of the Virgin Samaramis on December 25th, worshipped as Lord and Savior. He was also, the child, the heroic Lord, the Sentinel, the healer, he is mocked and humiliated, killed by a boar, descended into the underworld and is miraculously raised from the dead for the salvation of mankind. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb and after three days, was resurrected. Krishna, of India, born of a miraculous conception to Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming, he performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others, and upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is there are numerous saviors, from different periods, from all over the world, which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days and the inevitable resurrection? Why twelve disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adore the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12, at the age of 30 he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples which he traveled about with performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. The Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the three kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation, Virgo, also known as, Virgo the Virgin. Virgo, is also referred to as the house of bread. And the representation of, Virgo, is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represent August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation, Virgo, a place in the sky, not on earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. 
and from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized, for the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs, the sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, Australis, constellation. And after this time on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death, and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring, and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night. And the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. It must also be noted, in the celestial mythos, Judas is the, backbiter, or Scorpio, representing the time of year when the sun becomes weakened. In the Egyptian version, Horus is stung by the scorpion, that is, the heat of the sun is rendered weak by the cold of winter. Furthermore, Judas's betrayal of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver correspondingly lays in the lunisolar mythos. The 30 pieces of silver represent the 30 days of lunation or the cycle period of the moon. Likewise, in the Gospel tale, Jesus is pierced in the side with a spear while hanging on the cross. The side wounding of the sacred king victim is a widespread custom. In the sun god mythos, the side wounding also represents the annual weakening of the sun, in the sign of Sagittarius, the archer at the approach of the winter solstice. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus being the sun. It all started in Babylon. The origin of the Eucharist. In ancient Babylon, a queen named Semiramis married her son Nimrod and then declared herself to be a goddess, and she went under names like Dinah, Venus, Queen of Heaven. And then uh, Nim when Nimrod died, she said he was the sun god Baal. So she became the mother of the sun god Baal. And I have done some videos on who was Tammuz and who was Samaramus, who was Nimrod. So anyway, Samaramus gave birth to Tammuz, and that began the mother and child worships. And here are some of the names, Tammuz, Baal, Osiris. We're going to talk about Baal. And, uh, today, the Roman Catholics pray to Mary as being the queen of heaven, but they really don't know they're praying to Samaramus. And she was the mother of the sun god Baal or Cyrus. Century later, in Egypt, the Egyptian priests developed a ritual known as transubstantiation to pull their sun god out of the sky and put him in a wafer. The Egyptians would then eat their god for spiritual nourishment. And here are a couple of definitions. In religion, substantiation is a mythical action by which the bread or wafer, the wine, or the cup taken during Eucharist, during Mass, become, in reality, as children are told, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Transubstantiation in Christianity, the change by which the substance, though not the appearance, of the bread and wine in the Eucharist becomes Christ's real presence, that is, his body and blood. The origin of Catholic practice of transubstantiation is an inherited version of the ancient Egyptian ritual of making Osiris cakes, and that is making uh, the symbolic 
reborn or regrown god Osiris into a cake. So, in another name for the sun god is Osiris and Baal. Here uh, on the left is a corn mummy uh, made with grain and mud uh, to represent Osiris. And uh, the Egyptians ate uh, this bread uh, representing the reborn Osiris. Then above is the Catholic version of this child eating the Jesus wafer during Eucharist. And they're told in reality that this is the body of Jesus. So in Bartholomew Brewer, in his Mystery of the Eucharist, summarized how Osiris cakes became Jesus wafers. The doctrine of transubstantiation does not date back to the Last Supper as is supposed, like many of the beliefs and rites of Romanism, transubstantiation was first practiced by pagan religions. In Egypt, priests would consecrate mess cakes which were supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. 3100 BC. The idea of transubstantiation was also characteristic of the religion of Mithra, 300 BC, whose sacraments and cakes and the Hama drink closely parallel the Catholic Eucharist rite. In modern time, many children the world over are given the wafer of Eucharist and told simply that it is transformed body of Christ without being given the detail that this is actually symbolic of the Osiris cakes of bread made and eating during the, the Kohaic festival that Egypt had every year. By eating the God in the form of the Eucharist in a type of communion in leavened cakes, Osiris divinity in immorality became, pardon me, immortality became that of the worshiper and a spiritual communion through becoming one with their God-man. The sacred ritual of Osiris consisted primarily in the celebration of the Eucharistic rite, in which the advocate and followers of Osiris eat the flesh of their God in the form of wheat cakes and drink his blood in the form of barley ale. Catholics believe that their priest has the power to turn the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. They believe that the substance of bread and wine are fully transformed into Christ's flesh and blood, despite the fact that it still looks, feels, and tastes like bread and wine. Just after the Second World War, there was an incredible series of archaeological discoveries in the UK. They revealed a network of Roman temples from London in the south to Hadrian's Wall in the north. They were dedicated to a pagan religion that existed at the same time as Christianity and to a god who had striking similarities to Jesus, Mithras. Lindsay Allison Jones is the director of the Museum of Antiquities at the University of Newcastle and an expert in the mystery cult of Mithras. Oh wow, this looks really well preserved. It is, isn't it? Yes. Now, what could I have expected to see if it was uh, in its original condition? You probably wouldn't have seen very much at all because it was sunk right down. The worshippers of Mithras um, were trying to reconstruct, um, in a sense, the original cave of Mithras. So they wanted it dark, they wanted it subterranean. This would have been doorway, you would have gone in through here. You would then come in through here into the actual temple itself. Um, and you'd see in front of you the three altars there. And behind that, there would be a large relief showing Mithras killing the primeval bull. That was the act of creation for the worshippers of Mithras. May he bring us help. May he bring us comfort. May he bring us joy. He, the awful and overpowering, worthy of sacrifice and prayer. Mithra, the lord of wide pastures. And Mithras is a god to the good side, I presume, the, Myth, the light. Yes, Mithras was the lord of light. That He was basically attached to the sun god who ordered Mithras to go and kill the primeval bull to release life force for the benefit of mankind. Mm, that's interesting symbolism there. Yes. So you've got this powerful deity and then this kind of sub-deity who acts as a, ki a kind of saviour yes. figure for humankind. The rise of Mithras almost exactly parallels the rise of Jesus although his origins could be much more ancient. Some say he was created by the Romans. Others 
that he came from Persia and India. Mithras was a, was a seen as a saviour god. He was unusual amongst the gods in that you weren't really trying to bribe him in quite the same way that they were trying to bribe some of the other deities um, to make sure that you were, your life on earth was as comfortable as possible. Um, Mithras was rare in that he actually offered you a life after death. So if Mithras predated Jesus and is also a saviour god who offered his followers a life after death, did Christianity steal these ideas? It was a mystery cult. Um, we certainly know that they were having ritual meals. It seems to have been a fairly basic feast, based largely on the chickens, mm. on bread and on wine. Bread and wine? Bread and wine, yes. I mean, you know, it's got similarities with early Christianity, the sense of feasting, um, the sense of discipline. You don't have to appease the deity. You work at things for your own mm -hmm. good. Um, there's a deity who is a, a god of light, who is sent by a major deity to um, kill his nemesis in mm -hmm. order to redeem and save the world. Yes, the early Christian fathers who wrote a lot were very upset about Mithraism. They thought that Mithraism was parodying Christianity. This so infuriated many early Christians that they felt they had to publicly denounce Mithras and his worshippers. One fourth century Christian writer, Ambrosiaster, tried to demonize their secret rituals. What travesty is it then that they enact in the cave with veiled faces? For they cover their eyes, lest their deeds of shame should revolt them. Some, like birds, flap their wings, imitating the raven's cry. Others roar like lions. Others bind their hands with the entrails of fowls and fling themselves down over pits full of water. What shameful mockeries for men who call themselves wise. Another early church father, Justin Martyr, tried to claim it was Mithras who was copying Jesus. Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, This do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body. And having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras. The problem for Christians was that the similarities did not stop there. One tradition claims Mithras even had a virgin birth. Mithras, there are two stories, one that he was born from the living rock and the other that he was born from the cosmic egg. So there is potentially a crossing of ideas and even potentially a merging of ideas between Mithras and early Christianity. Potentially. Uh, there is even a story that uh, Mithras's birth was witnessed by shepherds watching their sheep. But that, again, is a much later story, and you don't know whether, at this point, Christianity and Mithraism is all getting rather intertwined and it's getting confused. Mithras was a pagan god with a story, a purpose, and elements of ritual very similar to that of Jesus, but one whose origins could predate him by thousands of years. Early Christian fathers were very worried about the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism, especially the charge that Christianity borrowed many of its ideas from this pagan cult. So when paganism was officially outlawed, particular animosity was shown towards Mithraism. Many of its temples were destroyed and others had churches built on top of them. But Mithraism did leave one mark on Christianity. When later church fathers were deciding what anniversary to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, they chose December the 25th, the winter solstice, which also happens to be the birthday of Mithras. I had been told that there was another place, one of the key locations for early Christianity, where the similarities between Jesus and other pagan gods are even more obvious, Egypt. It has also always puzzled scholars why Christianity took hold so easily here. One theory claims it was because of its many parallels with ancient Egyptian religious ideas and rituals. Egyptologist Dr. Boyana Moisov is an expert in the ancient cult of Osiris. She claims it has uncanny similarities to Christianity and the story of Jesus. I met her in Abydos in Upper Egypt at the 3,300-year-old 3, temple, 
dedicated to the cult of Osiris. Can you tell me what happened here? Well, once a year there was a festival of Osiris and the myth of Osiris is the most ancient myth of Egypt. The festival lasted for about a week and reached its culmination on the last three days. And um, on the first of those three days, the earth body of Osiris would be buried. During the second day, vigils in the temple were said uh, for the God's resurrection. And then on the morning of the third day, the statue was brought out into the court through here and all the pilgrims who have gathered from all over Egypt celebrated the resurrection of Osiris. How common was that kind of story? Because for me, the, the story of death and resurrection of a, of a deity emerges with Christianity. So was it common for people to think this way? Well, in the Nile Valley it was. And uh, in the ancient Near East you also have uh, the myths of the sacrificed saviour gods who died for their people and were resurrected, came back uh, to life and would lead uh, all the righteous souls to salvation and eternal life. Well, what would I have seen if I was here 3,000, 4,000 years ago? During the festival, on that night where they buried Osiris, lights were lit and candles were lit all over Egypt to commemorate his burial. So if you imagine the temple, which is full of light, full of incense, people carrying candles and praying for the God's resurrection, the mystery of it, chanting prayers uh, for his resurrection. If you imagine incense, uh, candlelight, uh, vigils, it would have been magical. Many similar rituals are still carried on today by the Egyptian Coptic Church. Which other elements within this passion play, within this myth, have parallels with Christianity? Well, baptism in the holy river in the Nile, which were considered to be a sacred river, uh, the sacred Nile water, which was carried into the temple and uh, the statues were anointed with it. The eating of corn bread as the body of Osiris because corn um, came about through the sacrifice of Osiris. So this whole eating of bread and drinking of beer that issued uh, from the risen God uh, is also paralleled by the Eucharist Mass in Christianity. So the corn bread and the beer are paralleled today by having the bread and the wine. Exactly. There's a very interesting image in that last room and it consists of the dead Osiris as a mummy placed on a lion bed. His wife Isis hovers over him like a kite, like a bird and at this moment they're engendering the saviour child. So it is uh, the moment that uh, life is being transferred from, from death to life, from father to son. So it's sort of like a miraculous birth. It's a miraculous birth of the saviour child. Wow. These are ideas that we find in the Christian story of Jesus. This is a major revelation because it seems to me you're suggesting that the idea of a saviour God who redeems the world doesn't just begin with modern Europe, doesn't even begin with the ancient Near East. It goes all the way back to the earliest forms of human experience out of Africa. Absolutely, it does. The Qur'an declares that those Christians who deify Jesus are imitating pagans of old. Here the Qur'an demonstrates remarkable insight by pointing out that Christian beliefs about Jesus originate from past pagan religions. The message of Islam, like Christianity, was also delivered to a pagan audience. But unlike Christianity, Islam's monotheism was untainted and remains pure to this day. Even rabbis acknowledge this fact because they permit Jewish people to pray in Muslim places of worship in the situation where no synagogue is available. Rabbi Maimonides, a leading authority in Jewish law, wrote the following with regards to the Islamic concept of God. These Ishmaelites are not idol worshippers in the least, and paganism has long since cut off from their mouths and their hearts, 
and they worship the singular God properly and without any blemish. By comparison, Jewish people are forbidden from even setting foot inside churches. Rabbi Maimonides had this to say about Christianity. Know that this Christian nation, with all their many different sects, are all idol worshippers and all their holidays are forbidden, and we deal with them regarding religious issues as we would pagans. The Kaaba is situated in Saudi Arabia and represents the holiest site on earth for Muslims. Today it contains neither idols nor images. But before the advent of Islam, the pagan Arabs housed numerous idols inside the Kaaba. So central was the Kaaba to idolatry that pagans from all over Arabia would make pilgrimage there. In the short span of just 23 years, Islam managed to completely eliminate all traces of idolatry, taking people away from the worship of carved images to the worship of the one true God of Abraham. When it comes to preserving the purity of monotheism, just how did Islam succeed where Christianity failed? The Quran takes into account the psychology of its audience, which is demonstrated in its use of language. When God defines the relationship between himself and mankind, he avoids terms like father when referring to himself and sons of God when referring to human beings. Such language can be easily misunderstood, especially in the minds of those who come from a background of idolatry and are used to interpreting such language literally. The Quran also outlines its doctrines clearly, with God describing his nature in such a way that it is impossible to get it confused with polytheism. God revealed the Quran in order to rescue mankind from the polytheism that we are drowning in. The Quran restores the original monotheistic message of Jesus, who is not part of a trinity, but rather a human messenger and the Messiah.